Count Dankula is wrong that Ted's manifesto contains anything approaching the based red pills that he claims are there. Rather, his entire ideology is riddled with fantastic errors leading to perhaps the most anti-human ethics that one could think of. Stick around and I'll explain exactly why this is the case. Dankula begins his review by pointing to the argument that technological development leads us to the many social ills we see today by stripping us of our liberty, which reduces us to mere cogs in the machine under the boot of the state. This argument is flawed in that the state itself enacts a decivilizing tendency on society due to the taxation it engages in. In short, a man can only acquire taxable assets through production, homesteading or trade. Therefore, a tax discourages people from producing, homesteading and trading, choosing instead to engage in more non-productive leisure. Therefore, there will be a lower level of capital development than otherwise. This has a side effect in that it will tend to raise people's time preferences. In other words, taxation is actively pushing people towards barbaric savages concerned only with the present, and away from civilized gentlemen who plan far into the future. Therefore, this argument of Ted's is a contradiction in asserting that capital development is capital regression. As we know, contradictions are falsehoods, meaning this thesis cannot possibly be correct, however tempting it may appear. Dankil goes on to state that societal subservience is caused by the fact that as technology progresses, the system based around it increases in scope, which inherently molds society around supporting its growth. The problem here is that the system based around technological progress is in fact the division of labour. So to translate from primitivist into standard parlance, societal subservience is caused by the fact that as technology progresses, the division of labour increases in scope. After unpacking that phrase, it is baffling to me that anyone could see it as a bad thing. A furthering of the division of labour is fantastic for society. It is precisely this leveraging of comparative advantage that brings society out of bare subsistence and into a world where we can live lives of a higher quality than most medieval kings. This is something we should be immensely grateful for. Dankula does cite a supposed counterexample in hopes of demonstrating such development to be a bad thing in the slow march towards a cashless society. This example is flawed in that said push is a direct result of state central planning not any inherent flaw in capital development. We see here that the real issue is statism, not technology. This is a common flaw in primitivist thinking. They attribute issues where they do not belong. The argument continues with stating that erosion of our liberties is achieved in the technological society by providing populations with the feeling of security by having their basic needs met. There are two ways to interpret this. Either we say that the basic needs are met through some manner of poverty subsidy, or they are met simply by being of such low cost to seem almost free. The latter case is the result of the division of labour, which I have described above, and the former strikes me as being blatantly the fault of democracy, not technology. As Hoppe describes in Democracy the God That Failed, the democratic state will be incentivized to not only redistribute wealth towards itself in straight tax, but also to redistribute wealth from unfavoured groups towards favoured groups outside of its own apparatus. This is, in effect, a strategic buying of favour to keep the masses impotent to stop it. Moreover, the naked disparagement of having basic needs met is simply absurd. Man is faced with scarce means that must be economised towards the attainment of numerable ends. If he's more able to meet the ends of, say, getting water and food, he can now free up some of the labour that would be spent there towards attaining yet more ends. To wag one's finger at this is nothing more than an advocacy of subsistence living, which is contradicted when said advocacy is performed by anyone who chooses not to live like a lowly grub or common beast, including Ted, as even he kept his shack, his typewriter and his bike, among other small luxuries. Moving on, the further assertion that a more efficient allocation of means is less fulfilling as it is not in mere service of survival lacks any scientific rigour. If a man chooses the more efficient path, as he invariably will, he is demonstrating that he himself expects this path to satisfy more than any alternative. In short, asserting that this man is living a less satisfying life is simply applying one's own preferences onto this other man. But what makes other people's preferences more correct than the person in question? Moreover, this would be classed as an interpersonal comparison of utility an impossibility in economics. To escape this pit, the primitivist would require some objective theory of value outside of standard economics. Until such a theory is elucidated, this thesis is nothing more than a fart in the wind to be confidently ignored. Now, I must attack Ted's theory of the power process in some more depth. The thesis goes as follows. Human drives can be divided into three groups. One, those drives that can be satisfied with minimal effort. Two, those that can be satisfied but only at the cost of serious effort. And three, those that cannot be adequately satisfied no matter how much effort one makes. Further, humans require a struggle for power in order to feel fulfilled. This power process is the process of satisfying those ends of type 2. This is a sort of ideal middle ground. If you have a bunch of type 1 drives, you become stagnant. If you have a bunch of type 3 drives, you become riddled with mental health issues. The question must be asked though, what exactly is 
is the principal difference between ends of type 1 and type 2. We note that the opportunity cost, the praxeologic effort that is expended in attaining the goal, is subjective and ordinal, so it is impossible to state the cardinal degree of a given cost, only its relative position to other costs. Let's demonstrate this with an example. John has one hour of leisure time before he has to go back to work, and there are two things that he could do in this hour. He could either watch a baseball game or go for a bike ride. The opportunity cost of watching the baseball game is equal to the value attached to going on the bike ride. Similarly, the opportunity cost of going on the bike ride is equal to the value attached to watching the baseball game. We suppose that John chooses to watch the baseball game, therefore we can say that the opportunity cost of this course of action was lower than the other course, but we cannot say by how much. Moreover, consider Bob who also has an hour of leisure and chooses to spend it eating a hot dog in the local park. What could we possibly say about the opportunity cost of eating this hot dog in comparison to the opportunity costs of John? Clearly, it makes no sense to compare these values between people. What does this leave us with respect to Kaczynski's above classification schema for ends? A man will necessarily always be seeking to attain the end with the lowest cost, so is he always pointed at type 1 ends? Without a sound definition of effort, the theory has no basis in truth. Ted does give an example of one of these type 1 ends which he terms surrogate activities in Emperor Hirohito, who dedicated much of his time to becoming a distinguished marine biologist. This is supposedly an artificial goal in contrast to the real goal of feeding oneself, but what exactly makes removing the uneasiness of hunger any more real than removing the uneasiness of not knowing enough about marine biology? Again, Ted's theory is nothing more than flashy wordplay with no sound basis in science or philosophy. Dankula also elucidates the Kaczynski environmentalist point, that the shrinking of the domain of nature is bad. Such an ethic is flawed in its anti-human implications. The very purpose of action, which is a prerequisite for human life and prosperity, is to shrink the wilds back and transform them into forms that are better suited to satisfy man. This is a good thing. A truly wild kumbaya world is necessarily a world that humans would despise by their own demonstration. Lastly, Dankula acknowledges that he is in contradiction with the hypocrisy inherent in advocating Ted's primitivism over the internet. Unfortunately, such a recognition of hypocrisy does not resolve the contradiction. Knowing that you are wrong does not make you right. It is the duty of rational men to purge any falsehoods from their minds and their actions. This video has been focusing mainly on Dankula's interpretation of primitivism, but this is not all there is to know about the subject, so you have to watch this video if you want an even greater assault on the apocalyptic ideology of primitivism.